So a lot of these panels and sessions are looking at the interface between human behavior and algorithms, um, which sets us up perfectly for our afternoon keynote presentation. Um, we have for your presentation titled The Truth About False News. Uh, Sinan Aral is the David Austin Professor of Management at MIT, focused on IT and marketing. He's also a professor in the MIT Institute for Data Systems and Society. At the IDE, Professor Aral leads our research track focused on social analytics, behavioral economics, and digital experimentation. He's currently a founding partner at Manifest Capital and on the advisory board of the Alan Turing Institute. So please help me welcoming Professor Sinan Aral to the stage. All right. It's an honor to be here. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Um, when I got here today, uh, I went to the green room, and Andy McAfee commented that he said, wow, you're dressed all in black. And I said, well, that's because I come bearing bad news. Um, so you'll forgive me if I sort of uh, take us down a notch here for a minute. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the research we've been doing about the spread of false news online and a little bit about what I think in terms of uh, what the implications of this are and what we could potentially do about it. So uh, on, in February of this year, uh, Special Counsel Robert Mueller uh, passed down indictments against three organizations and 13 Russian citizens uh, on charges of conspiracy to defraud the United States by meddling in the 2016 uh, presidential election. And one of the organizations that's named in that indictment is the Internet Research Agency, which is located in, or was located uh, in St. Petersburg. Uh, and uh, this is a picture of the Internet Research Agency. It's a four uh, floor building. Uh, one floor dedicated to the production of false blogs and news stories, one floor dedicated to the systematic spreading on social media of those news stories, another floor dedicated uh, to the uh, marketing uh, of these kinds of stories. Um, and it was with these indictments fresh in our minds uh, that we all probably witnessed uh, this guy, Alexander Nix, who uh, was the CEO of Cambridge Analytica, in an undercover video uh, taken while he was pitching his company's services to uh, somebody who claimed to want to run for uh, office uh, in, in the Far East. And what he said to this person was, yeah, uh, we can use very effectively fabricated stories propagated online to influence global elections. Um, so these two stories together about the potential spread of false news and what it could be used for uh, really have brought this topic to the forefront uh, of our collective unconscious in the last two months uh, alone. Um, the spread of false news, if we think about it, and, and we really don't have a lot of research that can describe for us what the measurable impact of the spread of false news is. We need a lot more science on the topic. Um, but my intuition is that it can really lead to some pretty bad outcomes. For instance, uh, if first responders, if uh, law enforcement use social media or information spreading online when they are responding to terrorist attacks. It could lead to significantly uh, worse outcomes during a terrorist attack if they're misled to be in a certain place when they should be you know, in another part of the city where, uh, where other things uh, are going on. Um, first responders uh, responding to natural disasters if they uh, believe through data that they're collecting that there are, you know, 60 people trapped in a building on a certain street corner, and in fact they're trapped, you know, 10 blocks away. The loss of a few minutes here or there could mean lives lost. Um, even have big impacts potentially on our economy, the misallocation of resources and investments. Uh, today, obviously, algorithmic trading uses massive amounts of social media data to make decisions about what stocks to trade. 
if that type of false information is seeping into the data that those algorithms are analyzing, it could potentially create systematic biases in the decisions that are being made uh, based completely on false information uh, and trading. There is a story <clears throat> that during Barack Obama's presidency, a single false tweet uh, that claimed that he was injured in an explosion created a $130 billion loss of equity value in a single day. Uh, imagine what millions of false tweets might do uh, when aggregated uh, over time. Obviously, one of the main concerns is the impact that it could have on our democracies uh, and on our elections. Uh, some of these impacts could be very large. And the very, the, the very sad truth of it is that we just don't know because there isn't enough knowledge, there isn't enough research uh, to date about what false news is doing to our society, how it's spreading, and so on. So when we started this project two years ago before false news was really a big uh, media topic, uh, there were very few studies about false news. They were anecdotal, uh, they were uh, case studies about a single story spreading online or a single event like the Boston Marathon bombing uh, or uh, the earthquake in Haiti and so on. Uh, so we thought it was important to do something systematic. So we conducted a study that was published on the cover of Science Magazine uh, at the beginning of March of this year. We worked with Twitter directly and my colleagues, uh, Deb Roy and Sarush Vasugi at the MIT Media Lab and I together uh, conducted this study uh, directly in collaboration with Twitter. We took the entire Twitter historical archive, every tweet ever tweeted, uh, in order to conduct this study. And the way we went about this was uh, we essentially collected the largest longitudinal data set of the spread of false news online by beginning with six independent fact-checking organizations that go through the trouble of fact-checking these stories and labeling them as either true or false. So we took all of the stories that had ever been verified in a public way by one of these six independent fact-checking organizations, and we used that as a baseline data set of labeled data for which we knew that certain stories were true and other stories were false. And these six organizations agreed on these labels uh, between 95 and 98% of the time, right? So to begin with, we wanted to know, we wanted to be confident that our corpus was reliable in terms of whether the items that we were talking about were actually true or actually false. When we collected this data set and we had this labeled data of true and false news stories that had been written over a 10 year period from 2006 to 2017, we went to Twitter and we searched for mentions of these stories. When we found one, we worked backwards to the origin tweet of that story and then we recreated by moving forward the entire cascade of the spread of this story online from the first tweet to every retweet. Now obviously uh, stories can have multiple cascades, more than one. If I tweet about it and you tweet about it independently, there might be two independent cascades or three or four spreading about the same story. So we collected all of these stories, uh, all of these Twitter cascades, and in the end we had about 126,000 cascades spreading, spread by millions of people over this 10 year period. So, this is a picture of uh, the data that we have here. Red is false stories, green is true stories, and uh, um, yellow is what we call mixed news, meaning the story contains partial, is partially true and partially false. It has some true information and some false information. You see some clear trends here. Uh, you see peaks uh, during uh, presidential elections uh, in terms of false news. You see a certain trend which looks like false news is increasing. I would um, caution you to make that conclusion because obviously there's a lot of selection bias as, uh, as Danny and Eric were talking about in the last panel. These are stories that have been verified. So it could simply be that verification is increasing and that's why we have uh, the trends that we see here. 
Um, but you see examples of the Boston Marathon bombings or uh, Apple v. Samsung or news about the 2015 Paris uh, terrorist attacks. And if we just look at false political news, uh, it looks like this, and you see spikes during the 2016 presidential election and the 2012 presidential election. Uh, there's also a single spike in the entire 10-year history uh, of the spread of mixed news, partially true, partially false information, and that's during the annexation of Crimea. Um, I dug into that data very specifically because I found that fascinating that there's one spike for a two-month period out of 10 years of the spread of mixed, partially true, partially false stories, and it happens to be during the two months of the annexation of Crimea. And if you want to find out what that story is, you'll have to read my book, because that's how the book opens. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. There's a bunch of different categories of false news. We looked at politics, urban legends, business, terrorism and war, science and technology, uh, entertainment, natural disasters, and so on. And what we did was we constructed these tweet cascades of people tweeting and retweeting, uh, and we measured the spread of true and false news. And in fact, this is probably one of the simplest scientific studies we've ever conducted uh, in the sense that we were just characterizing this observational data. We were just measuring how far, fast, deep, or broadly uh, this information was spreading in the Twitter sphere. So the number of people involved, how many hops away from the origin tweet is the depth of the cascade, uh, how, how quickly the information spreads, and whether it spreads through a viral branching process that's peer-to-peer -peer or more through a, a broadcast uh, um, diffusion. And we found some uh, interesting uh, you know, cascades. These are pictures of actual cascades from our data. The uh, green ones are true cascades, and the purple one is a false cascade of a tweet creating retweets and then retweets upon retweets uh, in the Twitter sphere. And then we just analyzed those measures of depth, breadth, time, and so on, how fast the information was uh, traveling, and we just compared the true news to the false news. And what we found was uh, a bit disturbing in my mind. We found that false news diffused uh, significantly farther, faster, deeper, and more broadly than the truth in every category of information that we studied, frequently by an order of magnitude difference uh, between the two. When we broke it down by category, uh, we found that false political news traveled farther, faster, deeper, and more broadly than any other category of false news. Uh, false political news is particularly salient in terms of uh, the spread of falsity um, in society, specifically uh, online. Now, obviously, uh, we're very worried about false news in 2016, but false news has been around for a very long time. Um, you know, I think it was Harper's Magazine in 1923 that very, was the very first time somebody used the phrase fake news. Uh, and we may be particularly concerned about it today because of the speed and breadth with, with which information can travel in today's society compared to uh, what has happened in the past. Um, and for instance, uh, there have been stories uh, I was told uh, just today about a story about one of our founding fathers uh, when he was running for president that he was actually dead. Uh, and the reason why this didn't have a big impact on the election is because at that time, false news traveled less quickly uh, than it's traveling today. So then we th started to think, well, why might this be happening? What can we look into to see if we can explain why false news is traveling so much farther, faster, deeper, and broadly than the truth online? And the first thing that came to our minds was, well, maybe it's a characteristic of the people spreading the information. Maybe the people who spread false news uh, just have more followers. So if they have more followers and they make a tweet, more people see it, more people retweet it. Or maybe they follow more people. Or maybe they tweet more often. Or maybe they're more often verified users of Twitter, so they're trusted more. Or maybe they have been on Twitter longer. And in each of those cases, the opposite was true. So people who spread false news have significantly, uh, significantly fewer followers, follow significantly fewer people, have been on Twitter for less time, are less often verified, um, and, uh, and, and tweet less often. 
Uh, so none of that could explain the trends that we were seeing. In fact, false news were travel was traveling farther, faster, deeper, and more broadly than the truth, despite these characteristics, not because of them. So we built a model that estimated the likelihood of retweeting true or false news, controlling for all of these factors and several other factors. And what we found was that people were 70% more likely to retweet false news than true news, controlling for everything else that we could think of to control. And so we needed to really think beyond these uh, original hypotheses about why it might be spreading so quickly. So we started thinking a little bit about information theory and Bayesian decision theory and some of the sociology literature. And if you look to those literatures, you'll learn a few things. Uh, the first is that um, information that is novel tends to be more valuable because it resolves more uncertainty about our world and can help us make better decisions about what to do next given the circumstances that we face. Novel information also attracts human attention at a much greater rate. So, when we are looking at an image or a video, something that pops into the image is going to attract our attention. This is probably an evolutionary response to wanting to see the tiger that is sort of behind the bush. And if I see that new information, I should be wary of it so I can uh, start to run as soon as, as possible. But we're attracted by this novelty. This novelty has potentially more information, uh, more value because it resolves more uncertainty in the world. And if you read the sociology literature, people who share novelty tend to gain in status because they're seen as being in the know or having access to inside information. Uh, so you seem to be sort of um, have your hands on pools of information that other people don't have. So we characterize this as a novelty hypothesis, that maybe false news is more novel than the truth, and that could be part of the reason that human beings are deciding to share it more often uh, than the truth. So the way we tested this hypothesis was we went to these Twitter cascades. Let's say that this person is within the cascade. They are retweeting the origin tweet. We looked at the past two-month history of all of the tweets that they had seen prior to seeing an incoming true or false tweet, and we used information theoretic measures of novelty to compare the incoming true and false tweet to the corpus of the 60 days worth of information that they had seen prior to seeing the incoming true or false tweet, and we measured, is the incoming false tweet more novel compared to what people had seen in the past 60 days, or is incoming true information more novel compared to what people had seen in the past 60 days? And what we saw across three independent measures of novelty was that indeed, uh, falsity was significantly more novel than the truth. Now, that shouldn't surprise you because it's easy to be novel when you're unconstrained by reality, right? <laughs> if it's just made up, you can pretty much uh, make up anything that you want. <clears throat> But this could be one of the explanations for the human judgment that is producing the spread of false news at a faster rate than the spread of a truth. <clears throat> and at that moment, when we, when we sort of came to that conclusion, we had our model, 70% more likely to be retweeted, it's more novel, and we said human judgment, we said, well, is it really human judgment? I mean, we've got these measures of novelty, they're highfalutin information theoretic measures of the difference between information that you have coming in and the corpus of information that you've seen in the last 60 days. Maybe it's novel in that information theoretic sense, but maybe the people don't perceive it as novel. So we thought, how could we get inside the brains of individuals as they're making these decisions when we don't really have a lab, we're not interviewing people, we just have this corpus of 10 years of data. So we thought, well, we could analyze the replies to true and false tweets and analyze the sentiment that is expressed in reply to the truth or in reply to falsity across eight different uh, uh, measures of sentiment, including surprise, disgust, fear, anger, sadness, anticipation, joy, and trust. And what we found was that in reply to false tweets, people were significantly more often expressing surprise 
and discussed, which corroborates this novelty hypothesis. Not only is the information more novel, but people are surprised by this information. And in terms of the truth, uh, people are, are significantly uh, more often expressing anticipation, joy, uh, and trust. So there's something about the salacious, novel, surprising thing that we just can't help ourselves from sharing. Okay? And when we came to that conclusion, we said, well, we keep talking about human judgment. Is this really human judgment? When we look at the congressional testimony in front of the US uh, House and Senate uh, intelligence committee investigations into uh, misinformation, what we see is a lot of testimony about the role of bots in the spread of false news, that it's really not humans, that in essence, software programs are the ones that are responsible for spreading false news. So we looked into that as well. We used two state-of-the-art uh, bot detection algorithms. We identified all of the bot uh, spreading in our data. And using these two algorithms, we pulled the bot data out, and we put the bot data back in. We did this in two ways. We eliminated bot tweets. And we also did a separate analysis where we eliminated bot tweets and any human retweet of a bot tweet or bot retweet of a, of a bot tweet. So any chain created by a bot, not just the original bot tweet, but any chain that depended on the bot in the first place, we removed, put it back in, removed, put it back in. We did the same analysis with and without bots. And what we found was that, indeed, bots were accelerating the spread of false news online. But they were accelerating the spread of true news at approximately the same rate. So they couldn't explain this massive difference between the spread of true and false news that we were finding uh, in our data. So the unfortunate conclusion from this is that human beings are a lot more responsible for the spread of falsity than, uh, than we had previously, previously thought. I want to mention one final thing that we did, because some of you may be wondering. As I mentioned, we collected the initial data by going to these six independent fact-checking organizations. right? So anything that a fact-checking organization fact-checked, we would take that as a ground truth for true and false labels. And remember, the six organizations are agreeing 95 to 98% of the time. However, you might think to yourself that there's another selection bias there. How do the fact checkers select which articles to fact check? It could be that they are particularly prone to fact check salacious things, or they're particularly prone to fact check false things that spread farther and faster and deeper, or that the act of fact checking itself can create changes in the diffusion of this information online. So what we did was we created a second data set, which was 10% the size of the first data set, about 13,000 rumor cascades. And these were uh, stories that had never been fact-checked by any of the six independent fact-checking organizations. We had students at MIT and Wellesley College fact-check them uh, separately, independently. So on this 13,000 uh, uh, cascade data set, which was never selected by any fact-checking organization, we ran the same exact analysis and we found the exact same results. So that selection bias is unlikely to be uh, uh, causing the, the results that we found. So a natural question that comes from hearing these results uh, and, and, these, and this evidence is, what can we do about it? Well, a couple of things, I think, are worth thinking about at least. So the first thing that we might think about is the concept of labeling. When you go to the grocery store and you buy food to consume, it's extensively labeled. You know how many calories it has, how many grams of protein, how many grams of sugar. You even know something about how it was produced. Is it organic? Is it free range? Was it produced in a facility that also produces wheat or peanuts if you have an allergy? But when you're consuming news, you don't have any of this kind of information. You don't know how often does this source produce information that turns out to be true or false. What's the likelihood that this story is true or false? How many independent sources does this organization require bef before its journalists are allowed to run with a fact? How many journalists worked on this story? How long did they work on this story? How many people did they interview? None of that information is available to us when we consume, curate, and share information online. 
Another potential way to think about uh, uh, addressing the spread of falsity is thinking about incentives. When you think about the Macedonian fake news factory that was created during the 2016 US presidential election, it was found that people in Macedonia were creating false news on blogs and other types of news sites and spreading it, not because they had a political agenda to affect the US election, but because they found that they could make more money spreading false news through advertising. They could make more money spreading false news than they could make spreading the truth. Why? Because false news was spreading farther, faster, deeper, and more broadly. And the more eyeballs they got to their stories, the more money they made from the advertisements that they ran next to those stories. So if we could curtail the reach of falsity, perhaps that would eliminate or decrease the economic incentive to produce it in the first place. Another thing we might think about, and something I'm sure Mark Zuckerberg is thinking about at this particular moment, is regulation. Maybe we should regulate the problem uh, away. I think this is a very, very difficult road uh, to, to, to traverse. So Malaysia just created uh, a six-year prison sentence for anyone caught spreading fake news. That's one way you could regulate it. Now. Um, you know, that might stem the spread of falsity, or it could just become a tool of oppression. Anytime somebody says something that I, as the incumbent, don't like, I call that fake news, and I put them in jail for six years. Now, we see the use of the term fake news being used as a political strategy all over the world, including here in the United States. Maybe making it illegal and enforcing six-year prison terms isn't the best thing uh, in terms of regulating false news. We could think about other things. Lots of debates happening now about, is Facebook a monopoly? Should it be broken up? Is Facebook a pass-through organization? Should it be responsible for what people say on its platform? The Communications Decency Act of 1996, Section 230 says that Facebook is just a platform that isn't responsible for the speech of others on its platform, but we recently passed a law that says that doesn't allow you to put advertisements for sex trafficking on Facebook, because that's something that we can all agree is not uh, the basis of free speech that we want to promote in our society. Where do we draw that line? How do we think about regulation in a way that's not overbearing, that's not going to uh, kill innovation, uh, but could potentially uh, help stem the spread of falsity. I don't have the answer. We have a lot more science and a lot more thinking to do on this particular point, I think. Another solution is machine intelligence. Can we train algorithms to recognize falsity? And can we build that into the systems uh, and the platforms in which this falsity is spreading? Um, Sarush Vasugi, who was our postdoc at MIT and, and before that a PhD student at the MIT Le Media Lab, uh, wrote his PhD thesis by building an algorithm, algorithm and a system uh, using machine learning to predict the veracity of information spreading on Twitter before it was ever fact-checked. Uh, at that time, he published this thesis in 2015. The accuracy was about 75%. Uh, not great, but also not a bad start. There are lots of things or features about falsity, the content of the information, the way it spreads, that may be useful in detecting it. Now, the problem at the heart of all of these potential solutions is that at some point, they all require someone to determine what is true and what is false. So the question becomes, who do we trust to be the arbiter of truth and falsity in society? Should we leave that to the platforms? Should Facebook decide what's true and what's false? Should we establish an independent commission of truth and falsity? I think I've read some novels, uh, historical novels about that kind of thing. Um, how do we guarantee that such a uh, commission will not be politicized in this day and age? I don't have answers to those questions either, but I think these are incredibly important questions uh, as we think about what we can do um, about the spread of falsity in society and about all of these consequences I outlined at the beginning of the talk about what it might be doing to our society. 
Unfortunately, uh, that is not the end of the story. Uh, what we have researched so far is false tweets spreading on Twitter. But if you read a little bit about the research on both sides of the problem uh, that's going on today, what you find out very quickly is that the falsity of tomorrow is a lot scarier than the falsity of today. Uh, the Atlantic had a great article which argued that we are entering uh, the end of reality because the next wave of false news, and you may have seen some of this online, is doctored and synthesized media, false video, false audio, and as more AR and VR comes online, false realities that we are stepping into. There is an arms race about creating this type of false audio and video and detecting this type of false audio and video, and it's not clear who's gonna win that arms race. I doubt very highly that anyone is going to publish a paper in the next six months, year, six years, that's going to be titled, The Solution to the Spread of False News Online. The bottom line is, this is going to be something around which we're going to need to remain constantly vigilant, and I highly encourage all of us to do just that. Thank you.